Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us 703-795-5364. 703-795-5364. We have operators standing by 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday to take your calls. Email jackberkman2016 at gmail as we come into the 20th century, not the 21st. Same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, or if you have anything at all that your local press will not help you with and you need attention for it and or you need to talk to Congress about it, you come to Behind the Curtain. And remember, we will help you. Joining us now, Ben Ippolito, a research fellow in economic policy studies at the AEI, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, His research expertise is public finance and health companies. Ben, welcome to the show. You're the ideal man to talk about the recent ruling on Obamacare. Now, let me ask you this. Okay, so Obamacare, we have a number of things going on at once. First of all, you correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be collapsing of its own weight. I mean, a number of these exchanges are in trouble. A couple of them have already gone away. It's A, it's collapsing of its own weight, which is a good thing. B, you have, you have a new ruling now by this judge in Texas, who's admittedly a conservative judge, but he rules against it, saying that Congress cannot justify it as a tax the way our friend Johnny Roberts said it could, this, that, and the other. The whole thing probably goes back to the court, back up to the Supreme Court, at least we hope it does. Uh, where are we? Where, does it, where do we stand with Obamacare? Give us the lay of the land. Well, uh, I think you're right. So starting with the exchanges, I think it's fair to say that the exchanges have probably underperformed relative to how they were sold. And what we see now on the exchanges is that it's not that there's nobody there. It's that the only people that are there are the ones who are getting heavily subsidized by the government. And so what we're seeing is almost no one who's above the threshold to actually get subsidies actually wants to sign up. And what they're saying is, geez, these planes are pretty expensive, but they don't actually seem that good. They don't have the features that I actually want for all that money. So we're having a real hard time getting those folks signed up. Now, this is a first. This is a first in U.S. history, it would seem to me, because the left made the argument with Obamacare. They said, well, you know, with an entitlement, once you get it, the American people will never want to give it back. It'll be just like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and all that. But this is different because the people uh, who the left, uh, whom the left says need it, most of them don't want it, right? Well, I think it's fair to say that it's pretty clear that people who aren't getting a big boost from the government are not buying the plans. And so those tend to be more middle class and up, uh, up households. You know, not rich people by any stretch of the imagination, but don't qualify for, for coverage. They pretty clearly are signaling that the plans that are being offered just aren't worth it to them. Obamacare has to be a disaster at literally every level. It's almost like his Mideast policy where, where, where you can't even find one. I'm looking. To, I always try to see things in the light most favorable to my intellectual opponent, and I can't find one nugget. Uh, with Obamacare, I can't find a single nugget. Like, for instance, my health insurance, I think it goes up every time I see a bill. It seems like it goes up by another $100 a month or something like that. It's doubled in the last two years in cost. What, what's going on? I mean, there, this is a disaster. Even Obama, is he still trying to justify this? Yeah, so certainly there's uh, there's still some pretty vocal vocal supporters for the Affordable Care Act. And I mean, you know, it, I think to look on the bright side, um, what I would say, at least, is for the individual market, which is, is kind of what we're talking about here, I would say that, that on the positive side, there's a version of that, that kind of public-private partnership that leverages the ingenuity and the innovation of, of these private firms to offer kind of contracts that that customers actually want, there's a version of that market that could work potentially quite well. But you have to look at that market in light of the regulatory apparatus that surrounds it. And that is where probably I think a lot of the disagreement, the fundamental disagreement about about Obamacare and, frankly, some of the problems that you point to probably are stemming from. What is so complicated? Like, I didn't understand these exchanges. Frankly, I don't understand why they ever created Medicare. Like with Medicare, why didn't in the 60s Congress just say, OK, we're going to buy private insurance for seniors, anybody who wants it? Why didn't they do that? Why, why does everything have to become so complex? Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends what your your goal is. I think, you know, in some sense, it's simple to say something like, you know, why don't we just do Medicare for all? 
or something along those lines. Um, it's appealing in the sense that it sounds nice, but it's actually it's really complicated. It is hard to run but, but an insurance no, company. But I know that. I know it's hard to do, but like for Medicare, just I don't want to get too far off topic, but why didn't the government just say, instead of creating a government program, we're going to buy private insurance for seniors? Wouldn't that have been cheaper and better? Well, that's actually where Medicare is going. And what you see with Medicare enrollment now is that seniors are taking the option to choose Medicare Advantage plans. And that's exactly what that is. It's you're handing over a little bit of money to the private firm and saying, hey, you well, figure it out. It's, it's 52 years and $2 trillion too late. That's the, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's this Congress should have done that in 65, right? <laughs> well, I, mean, I wasn't there at those original meetings. So if I was, I would have been on top of it. Uh, well, I guess that's true. Now, of course, the, we know the, the take you behind the curtain. We know why, why Medicare was created. It was created because they did a compromise with the, uh, uh, well, with the, the Congressional Black Caucus, as well as other liberals who wanted the creation of HUD, the Housing Department of Housing and Urban Development. So there was a trade involving ag subsidies, Medicare, and HUD. It was kind of a three-legged stool where they did a trade. That's why all that came into effect. Let me ask you this now, moving back to the ACA and Obamacare. Um, a judge recently ruled that it's unconstitutional. What do you make of that? Will the Supreme Court rehear the case? Will Roberts just say, well, the Supreme Court has already ruled on this? What will happen? I think the, the in the immediate term, what's going to happen is there's going to be an appeal to the Fifth Circuit, uh, and the legal uh, legal observers are actually relative to a normal ACA related case. They're much more uh, they're much more aligned on this case uh, across liberal and conservative lines than they typically are. In particular, most folks are saying that whether or not you like the ruling. The legal underpinning of the ruling is relatively tenuous, and so the expectation is it's probably not going to actually get all the way to the Supreme Court, or at least there's a good likelihood that it will not. Now, get when you Supreme say Court. the legal underpinning is tenuous, is that because the Supreme Court has already ruled the other way, or is there another reason? No, the issue the issue really comes down to this issue of se- severability. And the question that the court is, is tasked with answering is, can you actually did the did Congress ever intend for the ACA to exist without the individual mandate? Okay, so in other words, the ruling I get it, I get it. So it's severability yeah. of provisions, and just for our viewers, what that means is that if one provision goes down, should the whole bill go down? And that's so one, but one provision. In other words, so they brought this up, saying, in other words, okay, so they brought this t- case in Texas, and I didn't realize this. The argument was not to rehear the Roberts argument argument on taxes, although the judge ruled on that. But uh, maybe the issue was, okay, Roberts, the Supreme Court has ruled on the tax piece, but we're arguing that that piece should be severable or that piece should be not severable. So the whole bill should go down. Is that the argument in Texas? That's exactly right. And it's just a just a nail it down. It relates to last year's tax law. Last year, they effectively repealed the individual mandate. And so what the plaintiffs in this case are saying is, wait a minute, Obama sold us on this three-legged stool. You can't separate any of the one, any of the legs. Uh, and so lo and behold, if you, if, you, uh, if you take away the individual mandate, that's not separable from the rest of the law. In fact, the whole law has to go with it. And that's exactly what it's the complex, though, agreed. because you have two sets of congressional intent and then the question becomes, which set of congressional intent, or do you view it as a whole? That's complicated. That's a very complicated legal question. That's absolutely right. I get it. So what is the Supreme Court likely to do? Are they going to just rehear this on severability? Will Roberts reexamine the tax question? What do you think happens? So it depends what happens, uh, what happens after the Fifth Circuit. Uh, the expectation is that this, the Fifth Circuit's a pretty conservative uh, circuit, however, uh, legal observers are suggesting that it's probably not going to get uh, upheld there. And so the question is whether the Supreme Court would even really be willing to hear the case. Now, the, the, it seems strong, though, to me. I haven't followed this, but it seems strong on severability, right? Why would it be so weak on, I mean, because Obama and Pelosi clearly intended the whole thing to, to I mean, Obama, I don't think Obama wanted severability, right? I think you're probably right. It's certainly at least plausible, right? Um, I think what the arguments uh, they're making, excuse me, the defense is making, involve issues like the following. You're telling me that Congress never intended it 
to be severable, yet last year they literally only got rid of the individual mandate. But and I can see now. where that you can sweep that away because they say, well, that's a Republican Congress. The main part of intent, while that's relevant, the main part is to look back to 2010 and look what Pelosi said. I see the argument there. Mm-hmm. But even even arguing in the alternative and seeing it in the in the worst, the light worst for us, it would seem to me that Pelosi never intended severability, right? I think there's a good reason, or there's a good chance you're right. There are other concerns, though, with this case. In particular, there are some questions about standing. Um, given that there isn't a isn't a uh, mandate penalty anymore, some have argued that, well, do they really even have standing to sue? Who's being harmed here? That's one of the questions that the court has to deal with as well. All right. Ben Ippolito, Research Fellow, Economic Policy Studies, American Enterprise Institute. An all-around great expert in healthcare. Ben, if we're real lucky, we'll have you back again. Back in a moment. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us. 703-795-5364. 703-795-5364. Operators standing by 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday. Also taking your emails, Jack Berkman, 2016 at Gmail. 2016 at Gmail. Same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, we will never quit on the Rich family. Never quit on the city of Washington. We will find the killer or killer of Seth's. We will solve this mystery. Joining us now, David Beer, immigration policy analyst at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. We're going to talk all about immigration, the wall, and the government shutdown and the shutdown. David, welcome. Thanks for having me on. All right, so we have heard a shutdown here, but you know, I'm kind of I and probably a lot of conservatives who are concerned about immigration uh, have a lot of concerns about Mr. Trump. Leaving aside your particular views on immigration, do you think Donald Trump has created a political problem for himself, e.g. the possibility of a Republican primary in 2020 by walking away from the wall? Oh, I don't think so. I, I think his support is quite solid, and uh, I think his supporters are more likely to blame Democrats for failing to. Do you really? I mean, the but, wall. But he's had a num- but he's, he's had a number of shots here. I mean, it's not just a one-time thing. This is five or six chances in the last two years, right? I mean, he's had a lot of shots here. Defense bills, omnibus budget bills. He's had all kinds of chances. He walks away. I mean, he's not fighting. You know what I mean? There's not one square foot of the wall ever been built. Well, you know, ultimately, if you shut the government down, he already took credit for shutting it down. And he would have to assume that the Democrats would somehow give in. And uh, that was, in his opinion, pretty unlikely. And so uh, the outcome would have just been an extended shutdown in which he is taking all the heat. So... I understand it from his perspective that uh, it didn't make sense as a political calculation, but I agree with you uh, that, uh, you know, really this is his central campaign promise, and he's failed to deliver on it. I mean, nothing is more, nothing was more vital or essential to campaign 2016, DJT, than the wall, right? I mean, nobody could argue that. The wall was the lead-in for every debate. It was the uh, lead in for every campaign commercial it rallied the base i mean it just seems to me you walk away from the wall i mean it's one thing not to there should at least be a symbolic gesture to begin the wall right i mean this is pretty serious stuff well certainly uh you know you're talking about the very first words out of his mouth practically in the presidential campaign were i'm going to build a great big wall and uh the reality is he's not going to build a great big wall, uh, certainly not before 2020. It's interesting. He'll have trouble. I wonder what the reelect, the reelect is starting to look like a George W. Bush campaign. Is it not? It's starting to look like Bush 04 or something like that. I think he's evolving or devolving into being the Bush family, right? Well, he's, uh, you know, he's 
recognizing how difficult it is to get everything that you want. And, you know, the, the first half of the promise was, I'm going to build the wall. The second half of the promise was, Mexico's going to pay for it. Neither one of those, uh, you know, promises are going to be You kept. know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a guy named George H.W. Bush who in Houston that year, read my lips, no new taxes. That's what that sounds like, huh? Yeah, broken promises do hurt politicians, and and this is going to be a pretty big broken one by 2020. All right, so let's look at the politics of this. Okay, with the wall. Now, I guess it's tough because if you – obviously, if you fought for the wall – then it helps the base. You can grow the base, but it hurts you with all the suburban swing voters. He probably has the base almost as large as it can be, right? And what he needs are more swing voters, and he's having trouble getting those, and a shutdown wouldn't help in that regard. I guess that's the calculation. Am I right? You know, I think that's probably right. you got to win those that median voter if you're going to uh, win an election, and, and so that's who he's targeting. At the suburban coalitions, the one thing we saw, I guess, in election 18 is that those suburban coalitions that helped Donald Trump uh, in 16 were starting to break down. And that's the main re- that's one of the main reasons why Republicans probably lost control of the House in 18. If they had those old coalitions still hanging in there, retirements notwithstanding, we might still be in charge of the House. Yeah, and and to go back to the wall, I mean, really, the reality is he had offers on the table from the Democrats to pay for the full wall, not just the five billion he was asking for, but the twenty-five billion necessary to build the. And what did they want in return? What did Schumer want? And and he he wanted amnesty for the Dreamers, and basically everyone who you know, is analyzing this, is saying that's the only deal that's going to get him the wall. He's got to give Democrats something. And dealing with these kids who are brought over as children seems like a pretty low, uh, you know, a pretty small. I'd have taken that deal. I'd have taken that deal. Why not? You're not going to deport anybody anyway in large numbers. Why not take the deal? You, The politics of the wall with the base. See, that's win win for me. Because with the with the dreamers, you help the swing voters love that. The base loves the wall. That's something for everybody. I think yeah, that's no, a it, that's it, a win. It's common sense to everyone who's analyzing this on the outside. But uh, the White House turned that deal down uh, so many times that at this point, it's not even being discussed. It's just a question of whether or not President Trump wants to shut down uh, the government for this five well, million dollars that he wants without you know, asking for anything in return or negotiating around, well, what other things can we give you in order to get some money for the wall? I guess the reality could be the dreamer thing had become so associated with Obama that Trump is just so afraid that he, I guess he feels I'm in a good position. I'm so afraid of a crackback. I'm so afraid of a backlash with this thing. Maybe I uh, should just uh, hold my position. I guess he's playing it safe, isn't he? Well, here's the thing is I don't think that's the explanation at all, actually. If you look at what he demanded, he doesn't care about the dreamers one way or the other. And apparently he doesn't care that much about the wall one way or the other. Really, what he wanted to do was I want to legalize the dreamers. I want the wall and I want big cuts to legal immigration going forward. And that's where the Democrats said, we're not doing that. We're not going to cut legal immigration. And see, Schumer made him. I think Chuck Schumer made him more than halfway. Schumer gave away more than he had to. I I think, God almighty, I don't know. Schumer must have been surprised he didn't take it. I'd have taken that deal. McConnell was probably surprised. You know, I, I, I think I can't imagine why they didn't take that. I don't even. And then to go back in and say we want bigger cuts. I, I, I don't see this at all. I politically, I don't see it. Well, here's where I see it uh, in terms of why this is is not working for the president. The president really does want the wall, but his advisors aren't sold on the wall. And so they want other things instead of the wall. All right, David Beer, that is all the time we have, but that is perfect immigration policy analyst, Cato Institute. Thank you, David. We're real lucky. We'll have you back again. Back in a moment. This is a universe where everything is depicted as a Washington Post political cartoon. 
Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, taking your emails, jackberkman2016 at gmail, jackberkman2016 at gmail. Now, same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, we'll never quit on the Rich family or the city of Washington. We will find the killer or killers of Seth. Joining us now, Robert Spencer, director of Jihad Watch and author of the new book, The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS. Boy, I got to read that. You are the perfect guest to talk about ISIS today. Robert, welcome. Hey, great to be here, Jack. What is Jihad Watch? I love the name. Jihad Watch is a news uh, and commentary site dedicated to explaining to people what the jihadis are all about and what they are doing. Wow. So, okay. So the recent, let's start out with France. News last week, the attacks, ISIS claimed credit, uh, two people killed. Uh, Do you think ISIS is behind it? Tell us about France. Yeah, there's no doubt ISIS was involved. The father of the killer uh, actually said, he admitted after the attacks, that his son was a follower of ISIS. ISIS has called upon individual lone wolf Muslims to wage jihad attacks, attacking innocent civilians in crowded places, which is just what this guy did. And so they claimed credit. Uh, And the French authorities dismissed it. But the reality is that ISIS does not have a history of claiming credit for things that it wasn't actually involved in. So people think they do. They're not like the Taliban that say we'll claim credit for everything under the sun. The ISIS is different. They're selective in claiming. Right. Maybe they build credibility that way in their mind. Yeah, and there is one big uh, caveat about that, and that's the Las Vegas shooting, where they, they have continued to insist that it was an ISIS operation. But the uh, well, that's fueled all, and that's fueled, that. and that's fueled a massive conspiracy agenda, has it not? Yes, that's right, and it's still up in the air because actually authorities have never really explained what did happen there. Well, let me ask you this: ISIS, do you agree that ISIS seems largely defeated? It seems to me Donald Trump has done a great job beating them up in Syria and Iraq and all over the world and shutting down their bank accounts and everything else. They seem they seem about ten percent of what they used to be. Am I right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They used to control a territory larger than Great Britain. And when Trump became president, he started to roll that up. And now they've lost it all. They lost the last city they controlled just a week so or they, so So just for our viewers, our listeners, they had formed a little country inside Syria and Iraq. They basically had formed their own little country on both sides of the border. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't all that little. I mean, there were 8 million people in it. It was very extensive in terms of territory. And they were terrorizing the population there. But even worse, at the end of the Obama administration, it looked as if they were not only there to stay, but gaining legitimacy. They were selling oil at black market prices to countries like Turkey, and the Turks actually refused to stop buying it. And so it looked as if they were going to follow follow the path that the Palestine Liberation Organization now, followed. Just to digress with the Turks and becoming legitimate. Now the Turks don't care about ISIS; they care about the Kurds. What was ISIS relationship with the Kurds? What what's uh, any, what's their Kurdish relationship? Well, they were uh, enemies of the Kurds because the Kurds want their own nation ah. and an independent Kurdistan, and ISIS wants a global caliphate, which would not allow for an independent Kurdistan or any. Other well, so that means uh, that that puts ISIS in a line de facto alliance with Turkey, of course, if they're enemies of the Kurds, right? Because that's Turkey's yeah, a one issue one- thing. Right. And Erdogan always aided ISIS. It looked like he wanted to co-opt their caliphate into his own restored Ottoman caliphate. Interesting. Now, where was the Russian? Now, Russia was kind of ambivalent on the whole ISIS thing, right? Now, ISIS was a threat to Assad, but they knew Assad wouldn't fall. Russia, where was Russia on ISIS? Well, Russia was uh, essentially propping up Assad. And Assad was the enemy of ISIS because ISIS is the, stood to be for several years the main beneficiary if Assad fell. So Russia was uh, always actually rebuked Obama and said, you know, you're not fighting ISIS. We are. And now it would seem to me that in today's Mideast, both Russia and America are playing the roles of Britain and France almost in the 50s in that they're they're pursuing what Morgenthau would call prestige policies in that neither country really has any tangible interests in the region. I mean, yes, America has an interest in protecting Israel, of course. And yes, we have an interest maybe in the oil of the peninsula. But the United States is fast becoming an oil exporter. Uh, The importance of the Mideast is declining. This is really Europe's issue, right? 
It is Europe that should be more concerned about the Mideast than the U.S. Yeah, the president is right to withdraw from Syria. We've got to stop these uh, the idea that our influence is only proportionate to our boots on the ground and that we have to stay in these countries and on some indefinite basis in order to secure some undefined goal. It's ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, Syria is right now not of immense strategic interest to us, and so there's no reason to have American Do we have any? What are our interests at this point in, in Iraq or Syria? Do we have any? Well, the only interest would be in containing Iran, which would actually be an argument for keeping the troops there. But I think there are more efficient ways to do that. You know, the next question is, why do we care about Iran? Because they're a threat to the peninsula. But that's even a weak argument for caring about Iran, right? I mean, what's, it just seems to me, I mean, we say these things, we chant these things like a Greek chorus. But what, what is the real reason to even care about Iran? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you one right away that's uh, overlooked, I think, largely. And that's Hezbollah, which is a wholly owned and operated subsidiary of Iran. And is operating right now in Mexico with the drug cartels. They're operating They're Hezbollah. To stay well, in but that's kind of, but that's that okay. But that's a specious argument for caring about Iran. I mean, you know, I mean, that's oh, just, I don't know. Iran, if, if 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 Iran, if the mullahs fell, then Hezbollah would disappear. Yeah, I, you know, yes, but I mean, okay. And we, again, we certainly we're against Iran. They're destabilizing the region. We care what they do in Lebanon. We care what they're fighting the Saudis in Yemen and the penins- on the states on the outer part of the peninsula and all that stuff. But it just seems to me America's interests in the Middle East are really declining rapidly. The big concern I have is that Europe is not preparing to pick up the mantle. The French, for everything oh, that's, that's happening, yeah. Macron wants all this stuff on the world stage, but he's not rebuilding the French army. Uh, neither Theresa May nor David Cameron did a thing to rebuild the British Navy. Lord knows the Germans can build armies, but they're not. I mean, that's like a yeah. completely emasculated society. I mean, what's going on here? Europe, Trump talked about forcing Europe onto the world stage militarily, but he's really not doing that. What's going on here? Yeah. Well, the problem is that the, uh, the European governments are these globalist, socialist, internationalist monsters. And so they want Trump to essentially become like them and then bankroll them and serve as their military. And he has very different ideas. But uh, the idea that the Europeans are going to step up and uh, take care of the Middle East is Uh, Well, it's unlikely in light of the fact that the mass Muslim migration into Europe is essentially making Europe into the Middle East. Well, it's it's, it's kind of time for the U.S. to say, look, you know, the problem is if somebody knocked over the Eiffel Tower in a major attack in Paris, the French would look to us and say, well, avenge our defeat. And probably we would go and avenge it. But it's probably time to leave these adolescents on their own and let them handle their own affairs. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, they've been depending on us uh, militarily and financially for far too long. It just, the, the, I mean, the whole purpose of Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan 70 years ago, was to make Europe responsible again for uh, collective security in the heart of Europe. And we're not doing that. It's not doing that. And all that money seems to be wasted. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, and that's a good way that he, that he could present it the president is saying this is the culmination of the Marshall Plan. You're grown up. All right. Take care of yourself. Robert Spencer, thank you so much. Director of Jihad Watch. Thank you, Robert. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Why don't you get a toupee with some brains in it? Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Well, last but not least plastic straws but remember if you want to take it behind the curtain you call us 703-795-5364 703-795-5364 taking your emails jack berkman 2016 at gmail you know it jack berkman 2016 at gmail coming into the 20th century certainly not the 21st same number same email if you know anything about the seth rich murder mystery remember operator standing by 7 a.m to 7 p.m monday through friday joining us now Angela Logamassini. Did I get it right? Did I you get got it? it? Perfect. Logamassini, Senior Fellow, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Welcome. Well, there's all this uproar over plastic and plastic straws, plastic generally, but mainly plastic straws. I guess that's the, the main uh, part of the problem. Let me see if I got this right. The city of Seattle has banned plastic straws. 
Uh, New York City uh, Mayor Bill de, uh, Bill de Blasio is trying to ban uh, plastic straws. Starbucks, Hyatt, and Hilton are all abandoning straws altogether, paper and plastic. I don't know what they're going to do, just no straws for the kids. And the, the biggest absurdity of all of this, there's a number... They say that there's 500, uh, 500 million plastic straws a year produced. This number isn't even accurate. It comes from a little boy who tweeted something, right? How, how accurate am I? Yes, you're very accurate. A, a, a boy did a study or for his school project, which, you know, is great. He's doing his homework and trying to figure out uh, something. So he called a few companies and got some estimates on how many straws they use, and then he made that number up. Um, certainly not scientific and certainly not something people should be making policy based on. Um, but I think there's, the problem is even larger than that. They're trying to ban things to you know protect the oceans, but actually not going to get that result from the ban. So plastic, all of this. Now, a paper straw. So the environmentalists basically, just to set the scene, the environmentalists are, are worried that plastic straws are being dumped into the ocean and dumped in other parts of the planet and will somehow destroy the planet, even though we know that's not true. But a paper straw, where all these nuts at places like Starbucks and Hyatt and Hilton, all of these lunatics now want to go with paper straws, even though a paper straw costs eight times as much to make. So these companies are so terrified of being terrorized by environmental groups that they're willing to pay eight times the cost for a drinking straw, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly they have the right to choose whatever product they want, but they're claiming they're better for the environment, and I would argue um, that's definitely not the case. Um, you know, everything has a trade-off. So, yeah, paper straws might degrade, but they also require a lot more energy to make um, and a lot more resources. That's why they're more expensive. The plastic straw saves a lot of energy up front. So the real question is, how do we manage the waste when it's when it's done? And, you know, get Letting litter go into the ocean is a terrible thing, but most of the waste in the United States is managed responsibly. It goes to a landfill, it's incinerated or whatever. Um, it's not going into the ocean. Most of the waste is coming from China and Africa. In fact, uh, it, a lot of it's coming from t 10 rivers. One study said 10 rivers in China and in, a in Asia and Africa is responsible for 95% so, of the, the waste street. going in the ocean. Plastic straws are a great it's a great microcosm. It's a great metaphor because what's happening is what the, envir the environmental, environmental movement is forcing the United States to change policies in ways often that drastically hurt Americans when, in fact, the environmental problems aren't being caused by anybody in this hemisphere or Europe or any of the, tier any of the, the rich countries. They're essentially being caused by China and Africa, which are, in terms of per capita income, poor countries. And more importantly than that, they are beyond the reach of our control. Yes, and it's a waste disposal problem. It's not a consumption problem. You know, people can use straws responsibly. This is part of the environmentalist's much larger campaign to take away a lot of our freedoms and our rights and, you know, access to certain consumer products. Plastics is, you know, a big, it's big business. So they've gone after plastic bottles. They've gone after, um, so now they're going after straws, cups, bags. You know, they just continue to do that. And the grounds on which they're basing these are just not supported by the facts. So as you say, I like what you said. It's not a consumption problem. It's a waste incineration problem. But the United States, we don't have, and I presume the Europeans are almost in the same category, we incinerate most of our waste. We don't really have these problems anymore. Am I right? Yeah, it either goes to an incinerator, to a landfill, or is recycled. So different parts, depending on what's more efficient of the waste stream, goes to different places. Like uh, aluminum cans are great to recycle. Plastics have a lot of savings up front. A lot of it goes to the landfill or to the incinerator. Everything in the landfill is basically mummified, whether it's a plastic straw or a paper straw. When they excavated landfills in the 90s, they found lettuce from the 70s. So the whole point is you don't want a lot of uh, things breaking down because that, that's more stuff to manage. You basically mummify it. Um, and it's perfectly fine there and causing no problems. Um, you know, litter, yes, that could be a problem if we don't manage that. But we actually do a pretty good job. And, you know, I remember back when I was a kid. You know, Streets were dirty in the 70s. Streets were yeah, dirty. Yeah, they were. 
But the, you know, the Keep America Beautiful, which is a private group, they started the public service announcements with the crying Indian. It was magnificent. And they helped greatly change our behavior. And so now um, it's much cleaner, which is a great thing. And, and those are the kind of solutions we should be looking for. Even for the oceans, there are groups out there that are going to try to clean it up. And they're probably you know, efforts. Angela, you're gonna you're third. gonna you're gonna kill me though. I do two things. I'm I'm largely a law-abiding citizen, but I have to make a confession here. Are you ready? I'm gonna confess okay. to my national audience. A big confession is coming. I do litter, and I do not clean up dog poop. And I'm ash- I, I, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but you know why I do it? Because I feel I get nothing for my tax dollars. And and the fact that my city and county, Arlington County, is made to clean up the dog poop, I really feel. That gives me some petty gratification as a, as a, mem- a resident of the state of Virginia and, a, and of these United States because I feel like I have to get something. I have to get yeah. something. I don't yeah. get anything from America. For years of creating <laughs> jobs and paying taxes, what do I get? Maybe you feel the same way. That's an aside. Well, I do clean up after my pups, but um, I just think it's important as you know, good neighbors to, to, to clean up after ourselves. Um, and one of the things, if you want to talk about government involving in, in this issue, we, they do collect our trash, so they're responsible. Um, it could be done privately, but right now in a lot of places they do. So they're responsible for making sure that that stuff doesn't fall off the trucks and things of that nature if you want to fight ocean pollution. So that, that is a, maybe a so, government role. Okay, so the but environmentalists, the environmentalists, these people are becoming like eco-terrorists, basically. They know that the environmental movement ha- has no real further role in the United States because it seems like here we've made just about all the changes you need to make, and the United States is doing fine and well. What's not fine and well are China, and the environmental groups can't do anything in China, so they can't raise any money there or make any money there, so they forget the real problems and focus on us. Yeah, I think there's different types of environmental groups. I'd say there are legitimate ones where, you know, they promote, again, your good neighbor policies. Keep America Beautiful, in essence, is an environmental group, and they've done a lot of good. It's sad that a lot of these groups have become very political, and they're more interested in passing regulations and controlling our private um, lives than they should be. I mean, they could be a great force, you know, to encourage people, say, to, to plant for birds and wildlife and to do good things. Um, but they've really left that realm. They're not interested in private conservation, not interested in any of that. A lot of them just want to regulate. And, you know, they do – they make raise a lot of money with fundraising and scary letters and – um, and that is a real problem. So but how do we fight ultimate- back? Like, how do we fight back? So these companies, let's look at, you know, Starbucks, Hyatt, Hilton. Well, Starbucks is run by lunatics, so forget them. But Hyatt and Hilton are fairly responsible companies. They make changes because they don't want to pay the PR cost. They figure, well, it's cheaper to just give them what they want on these straws and paper towels and whatever, plastic bags. We'll just make these concessions. The heck with it. Pay another 1%. It's cheaper than PR. Isn't that how companies think? Yeah, I mean, it is, it, they're just responding to marketplace um, realities, right? The only thing we can do is try to counter that and explain to people, you know, if you want to save, you know, the ocean, you know, wildlife in the ocean, um, banning plastic straws isn't going to do it. You're not going to get any uh, – a friend of mine calls it an easy virtue. They think they're doing something, but they're really not. It's an easy thing to do. Uh, certainly for the companies, if they just don't provide straws, they're gonna, that, that's a cutting cost measure for them. <laughs> so, but um, we have to remember, too, there, you know, once you start banning things, and that's really the big problem, it's not the voluntary stuff. You know, you can, you can educate people in the marketplace. It's the bans and the government regulations um, that are really a big problem because it's, that's an absolute no. Where do you see this you know, going? Freedom. Let me ask you this. We're talking about plastic straws. All of this could get a whole lot worse. I mean, this is 1% of the whole issue. These eco-terrorists, as I call them, what will they target next? Give us a sense on the negative side of what the future could look like if we're not careful. Well, they've already they've already done it. You know, you have to pay taxes to use a plastic bag. You have to, um, you know. Right, like here, to, like in the District well, of Columbia here, stuff. we pay five cents for a plastic bag. Right. We get tax. Right, correct. Right. Those seem rather small. People are like, all right, I'll pay it. And again, they think they're doing something and not really. But really get scared is when they start to go after essential products 
for instance, blood bags are made of plastic, and the, the next best alternative can't store the blood half as long or as well. Um, plastics are used in medical devices. There are groups out there actually fighting that, you know, and there are, there are costs and potential public health costs to that. They attack pesticides that are needed to grow our food, you know, and that will make food more expensive. It makes farming less productive, which means they have to, farmers would have to plant more, more land, and that means there's less land for wildlife. So there are a whole bunch of downstream effects that nobody really talks about. Um, with the straws, you know, people who are disabled have been, you know, they have spoken up. They wrote a, there was an article in the Post talking about how important plastic straws are to people who are disabled and need uh, that to, you know, consume liquids. Uh, so there are all kinds of implications that these groups really never never consider. So do you see it getting like, will they start banning plastic cups, plastic uh, plates? I mean, where does this they go? Are. I mean, so they already are. So in other words, in, uh, in, in we're going to be back to the 1940s in terms of the way we do a lot of things if these groups have their way. Yeah, I mean, there was a day where you would go and buy a, a coffee and you would get a foam cup and it was insulated made, you know, it's mostly air. It's a very efficient product to make, much more efficient to make than a paper alternative. Um, you know, neither of them, both of them probably end up in the landfill. So, the, you know, the cups, for, in terms of trade-offs, the paper cups do degrade, but those foam cups are so energy efficient and they were so great. They kept your Ah, but you, you see Starbucks. But you see Starbucks. Our friend Howard Schultz doesn't want to make changes in his paper cups, even though that's a lot more important than plastic straws, right? He doesn't want changes there. Is that what's going on? No, they're banning the foam cups everywhere, so in lots of places. And the, and the market somewhat deselected de them, so usually you get paper cups, but they're not necessarily any better. Um, I don't know if Starbucks is doing that, but from what I understand, Reason Magazine did a, a piece on how the replacement lids in Starbucks are using more plastic because now they're coming up with a lid that basically has a built-in straw or some sort of like a sippy cup, and it's going to actually use more plastic than if they had stuck with straws. So there's a lot of... Uh, Angela, Angela, this is fascinating. Angela Loga Massini, I got the name right twice in a row. What a name. Thank you so much. Senior Fellow, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Thank you. Well, remember, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com and, of course, always at radioamerica.com. Thanks. It's you, the listener and the viewer that makes all this possible. We'll see you next week. 